I'm here to talk to you about using um, the model nematode and C. elegans um, for research purposes. So before I start, can I just get a hands up how many people here have actually worked with or come across C. elegans before? No, one? Okay, brilliant. No, so no one's actually had any hands-on experience. Okay, that's a good place so I know um, how much introduction to give. Um, so as I say, my name is Rebecca Hall. I am a MRC um, fellow here at the University of Birmingham. And if you need me, you can find me in Biosciences N106. And so our interests um, broadly stem um, across looking at the way in which uh, microbes interact with um, our immune system. So looking at host pathogen interactions. Now, primarily, my research group focuses on looking at the interactions of fungal pathogens with the immune system. So looking um, at infections um, predominantly caused by fungi. Um, but we're also interested in things like um, polymicrobial interactions. So if you think about an infection, normally you're thinking about your one favourite um, fungus or bacteria that causes that infection. So let's take one for example, salmonella. And you're working on how salmonella causes infection. But one thing we need to remind ourselves is that no, bugs don't always work in isolation. Okay, So if you were to take um, a sample from a patient, you'll probably get, you know, 80% of that infection will be caused by one uh, disease-causing organism, but you will find other organisms in that um, infection site. And we're now learning a lot about what we class as polymicrobial interactions, so mixed species causing um, infections. And these interactions that they undergo actually can dictate in the way in which our immune system deals with that um, infection. And so that's another area... Um, of research which my group is interested in, looking at how combinations of fungi and bacteria um, actually cause infection and how that actually worsens the predictive outcome um, for a, a particular infection. And so we work on a number of different um, bacteria and fungal species. As I said, predominantly we're working on, in my lab on Candida albicans and Candida brata. Um, moving out more to work on things like Candida auris. You may have come across Candida auris in newspapers. It's a new Candida species which has come over from India. And as soon as it hit the UK, the first thing it did was close down between um, five and ten intensive um, care units because you were getting these um, very antimicrobial resistant um, infections. And so we're looking at the way in which our favourite pathogens, whether they be fungal or bacterial, interact with the immune system. And so to be able to do this, we need to have model systems which we can look at. Now, obviously, these can be from the most simple thing to um, looking at just the, 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 um, the fungus or the bacteria on its own to moving up to, to more complex things, such as using um, mammalian cell lines. So what you'll see here, this is... This round blob you see here, this is Cryptococcus neoformin, so it's a fungal pathogen. And what you'll see here is this is a, a mouse cell line, it's a macrophage-like cell. And what you'll see is you'll witness um, a process which has been termed as vomisotosis. So that is normally what you'd expect to happen, is that your um, um, pathogen that you're interested in gets phagocytosed by the immune cell and then is destroyed by that. That's what we assume that our phagocytes are there to do, to engulf and destroy the pathogen. But what you observe in this video when I play it is that actually this yeast cell seems to be pretty happy and instead of actually being killed by the immune cell, what actually happens is it goes on to escape. So we just follow it here, it kind of goes out of focus for a bit. It should come back. So we can see is the actual pathogen itself has actually grown, it's enlarged, and then it goes on to actually escape from um, the macrophage. And you can see it budding there as well, so it's 
is definitely not being killed by that, that macrophage. And this is one of the processes you see there. The macrophage basically um, spat it out. So now you have your fungus particle back into the environment and not no longer being phagocytosed. And what you'll see is two key things: is that the fungal pathogen is actually still alive, and so is the macrophage. And so that was something that was not expected um, until we had this um, introduction of live cell imaging to actually image the infection process in real time. And so that's one of the things in which we study, and one of the models which we use is um, ba basic mammalian cell culture. Other things that we can um, look at are more complex systems. So here we're in the macrophage, one, here we're looking at just one um, cell type. We can move on and, and use things like nematodes. So the most exclusively used um, nematode is that of, of Ciara habidatis elegans, or C. elegans. Um, and this is a, now uh, we're moving up to a multicellular um, organism. And so this is um, generally is a, a, how the C. elegans look. This is basically grow on an agar plate. And here's an adult walking across. And you can see here these are all the embryos. And then you've got some of the, um, the smaller larvae on the plate as well. And here again, we're looking at a multicellular organism. So we've got um, rudimentary organs and that. So this is a far more complex system than using just mammalian cell culture. We can also do infections using um, the wax moth um, model. So here, basically, you take your, your larvae. Um, these are quite big, so um, anyone goes fishing, you all um, have good experience with working um, with larvae. Um, and so they're, they're about sort of, sort of three to five centimetres, I guess, um, the kind of biggest one. And what we can do is you actually can handle those and when we're looking at pathogenicity, so basically here what I've taken is a variety of candida albicans strains and it infected them in with the larvae and then you can look, monitor death by this change in colour of the, of the um, larvae. And that's a process termed melanization. So basically, the, um, as the larval um, stage starts to die, you kind of get this melanization and this black um, phenotype. And you can measure how long it takes for your um, fungal or bacterial strains to induce melanization in this model. And then finally, another model that we use in our lab is um, that of the zebrafish um, embryo model. So here's a, a zebrafish, again, multicellular, so we're adding to that layer of complexity. Um, and you can do uh, many things with this um, because the zebrafish is actually um, transparent, so you can do live cell imaging. So in this movie here, what you'll see is somebody has introduced damage into the tail region, and if you follow the live cell, you can actually see these are all of the macrophages and neutrophils actually suck, um, being recruited to that site um, of damage to, to the tail. So there are multiple models out there that you can use to study your, um, your infection process. The question is, which is the right model for your organism? And so for today... Oh, forgot the, the final one, which is obviously the, the mouse model. So... All the other animal models that we're using, the small um, sort of thing, they're not covered by ethics. So you can use um, many of those models without having to go through ethical implications. But again, there are limitations to those models in terms of maybe they only have rudimentary organs, maybe they don't quite have the same immune system as us. And therefore, the ultimate um, model that we use is the mouse model system. However, in all research, you have to be able to show that you are reducing, refining, or even replacing the um, use of animal models in your system. So although this is your, your ultimate um, kind of model you'll be using, you can use all the other models before that to help refine your assay and to reduce the amount of experiments you need to do um, in the mouse model um, so that we don't have to um, infect too many uh, mice. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to focus on um, the nematode um, C. elegans and why we think this is such a good model organism. And so the work in C. elegans started back in 1963 when Sidney Brenner wrote to his boss and he basically said, the way which I see molecular biology going at the moment 
is within the next sort of 10 to 15 years, we will know everything that we need to know about molecular biology. Um, he says, and what I want to take the field to that next step, and I want to look at multicellular organisms. And so to be able to do that and to study multicellular organisms, obviously he needed to have an organism which is well characterised, which he would be able to do that with. And so he proposed taking and characterising this model system for his future research studies. And so Cielagans you can find in the soil. If you go and you take some soil, you should go to find some of the the um, nematodes crawling around in the soil. They are microscopic, so here you've got on this um, agar plate, this is an adult nematode, and so the adults are roughly maximum of about one millimetre in size. So if you were to take a plate and hold it up to the light, you can by eye just about see these nematodes crawling on the plate, but you can't see them in the larvae which, which are on that. Things that make them great for working in the laboratory is obviously one, they're small. You can have millions of these in your lab and they take up virtually no space whatsoever. And that's because they can be maintained on agar plates, so a standard 10 centimetre petri dish that you probably all um, are familiar with um, will hold thousands of these um, nematodes. And they're really easy to feed. So what you basically do is you make up a nutrient agar, um, which contains cholesterol, um, and then you basically coat that agar plate with um, E. coli, which is their preferred food source. So there's a particular strain of E. coli called um, OP50, which makes a really dense um, lawn on the, um, the agar and allows the nematodes to eat it. It's non-pathogenic um, to the, um, the nematodes. Um, and if you try to grow them on different um, E. coli food, food sources, you see that they much more readily eat the OP50 compared to other um, E. coli um, strains. So it seems to be a preferred um, favourite of theirs. If you're the kind of person when you're doing your experiments doesn't want to be in every day, you, nematodes are great because they will survive several weeks of starvation. I'll come on to that in a minute, but you don't have to worry if suddenly you're taken ill on your, your research experiment. Your animals are not going to die. They will still be there when you come back. And they can be frozen as well for long time storage. So if you think about an, a, like a mouse colony, for example, with the mice you have to breed them and you have to maintain them and there's a lot of cost involved in maintaining a colony of mice. Whereas with these nematodes, what you can literally do is you can wash the nematodes off the plate, freeze them down in glycerol and stick them in the minus 80. And so then if your research comes to an end, um, you can put them in the minus 80 and you can come back to them you know, five years later and just defrost them and get them out and then you've got that there. So that's really great if you need to maintain different um, cell lines of the, of the nematode. So if you want different mutants, different knockouts, you can have them all kind of stored in your laboratory and only get them out when you absolutely need them. So all of these conditions make um, the nematode a great model for studying in the lab and make it very easy to work with. So this is one of the nematodes taken as an SEM of one of them. You can see you've got a nice thick cuticle, um, and then this is the, the mouthpiece of the, um, of the nematode. And so if we now take that, <coughs> excuse me, if we now take that nematode and section it and, and in cartoon format so you can actually see the, the anatomy of the nematode, this is what you would see. So here you've got, basically it's two cylinders together with two bands of muscle running through um, the nematodes at the top and at the bottom. And then in the centre you've kind of got this cavity uh, which would be um, basically like the circulatory system if you like. So basically it just contains liquid which allows um, diffusion of air and, and, and nutrients through um, the, the two cavities. Okay? Again if we start at the head and basically take a section. So this is the mouthpiece that you saw here. And then you've got the star sort of sun nerves here. And then you've still got your muscle here. If you go back to now, you're going straight through the top of the head. It has like a nerve ring, not actually like a brain, but it has like a nerve ring which functions um, to coordinate all of its own sensory inputs. Um, and then as you go back, you then start to get the, the, the two um, cylinders developing. So here's your cavity here. Um, with your muscles again running down the side. 
And as you go further down, you start to get the rudimentary organs forming. So you've got the proximal and distal gonad, and you've got the rudimentary um, intestine that runs through. And then when you come um, right to the very end, you have the rectum excretion and basically all the muscles and, and the nerve cells. So we look at the, the nematode then. You have um, two... Um, Populations. So the most of the nematode you would see on your plate would be the self-fertile hermaphrodite. So this basically produces its own sperm and then fertilizes its own eggs. And so that would make up about 99.95% of your, of your uh, worms on your plate. Then you have um, a much smaller population of, um, of males. So... And a very, very small percentage is actually made up of the males. However, having the male pop males there in the population increases the fertility of the nematode. So, for example, the hermaphrodite, if you were to put one adult hermaphrodite in on a mini golf plate and then watch how many eggs it could produce over its lifetime, it would roughly produce 300 embryos, which would develop into, um, into worms. Whereas if you have um, allow mating to occur with a male, then basically that goes up to about a thousand nematodes, okay? So you do get increased fertility when you have um, the males present. And so C. elegans was the first uh, multicellular organism to have its genome sequenced. It's roughly around 100 million base pairs. Does anyone want to tell me whether that is bigger or smaller than the... Um, Genome of E. coli. Bigger? Yeah, brilliant. Yes, it is much bigger um, than the E. coli. It's about um, 20 to 30 times that of the E. coli um, genome. How about human? How's it compared to the... Smaller. Smaller? Brilliant. Yes, yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's smaller than the, the human genome as well. Um, and we'll come on to why that might be in a second. So the genome is, um, like us, organised into chromosomes. So you've got chromosomes 1 to 5, and you've got the, the X chromosomes. So if you're a hermaphrodite, you have two X um, chromosomes, and if you're a male, then you only have one chromosome. And then it's, of course, got its mitochondrial genome. Roughly each gene in C. elegans is approximately 5 kb, so, um, and you have about 26% of those genes have, uh, have introns. And so a lot of the genome is actually arranged into operons, so does anyone know what that means and why it would be important to have your genes in operons? See a couple of yeses? Anyone want to be brave and shout out the answers? Yeah? So operons are a group of genes that function together. And they're often uh, located sort of consecutively along the piece of DNA. And the idea is that they would produce a collective function. So bacteria have loads of them for certain metabolism, different substrates. Yep, that's, that's exactly it. So operons are very common in bacterial systems. It allows you to control the expression of genes which all undergo this, and the, uh, the, the same process, so that you basically can have only one promoter to trigger all the genes that, come, uh, that go off. And C. elegans still use this, they still have operons, whereas us, we don't have operons um, as much. So it's something that's kind of on an evolutionary scale, but the nematode still does have a lot of these, op these operons, and that's why its genome is quite densely packed. So if you take um, a nematode and then um, follow its life cycle, so if you start off at the the fertilised egg. Basically, the egg will hatch within eight hours into the L1 larvae. And then what happens um, when, when you have uh, got to the L1, you then progress to the, the L2. And at the end of each of these larval, what they call larval stages, the nematode kind of has a bit of a sleep, so a, a short nap. And during that sleep, what actually happens is it sheds its outer cuticle. So that really thick um, collagen cuticle that surrounds and protects the, the uh, nematode from the environment is shed at the end of each um, larval stage during the sleep um, process. 
And then so it then progressed onto the L3s, and then onto the L4s, and then up to the adult. And if you have your um, nematodes maintained at 25 degrees of room temperature, um, this happens in about two and a half days that you go from egg round to the adult. Um, but one key thing about Cyanogans, and this, was very, this has become very important um, for, for research, is this ability of the nematode to go from the L2 phage into what is known as a dower larvae. Okay? So this is a dormant stage of the nematode. So this is when um, you go on holiday for a week and you take, forget about your, your nematodes and you leave them on the plate. Your adults and that will die, but your L2s will enter this dower state of, um, of the larvae. Um, where, where basically they stop feeding but are still alive, and then as soon as they re-encounter food, so if you're thinking about this in a stressful situation, you know, you, nematodes are found in the soil, it's not plenty for the food. What that allows is you to switch off um, not your genes metabolism and allow you to move until you can find a, a more appropriate food source, at which um, point um, starting to eat again will then trigger you to go back into the, the L4 stage and then you would normally continue right the way around um, from your, back into the L4 to the adult and then start to lay eggs. And this is very important because it allows it, um, the dower larvae to extend its, its life cycle. So for, uh, if you have a look at this um, SEM, so here's a wild type nematode, what you can see here. This is the, the, the mandible, so the, the mouthpiece, which um, basically grinds up all the food. And in the wild type, you can see that basically there's, this just looks like a tube. However, in the dower larvae, what you see is um, you've actually got like a plug that forms, and that's because the cuticle kind of grows across to prevent anything from going straight down inside the nematode. Because it's normally doing this because it's experiencing a stressful environment. So maybe the soil is too acidic, or there's toxins or something in the environment. And basically, it decides it doesn't want to swallow that. So basically, it plugs up the hole, and then it moves on to find an, an environment which is much safer for it to, to live in. And then, in which case, it undergoes that larval uh, molt again. So it shreds that cuticle, removes this plug from its mouth, and then enables itself to eat again. Dower larvae allows it to um, increases the lifespan of C. elegans by up to um, ten times that, and. For a long time, Cyanogans were at the front of the, the pioneering stages of looking at um, age, the aging processes because they were able to identify that this um, aging is dependent on insulin signaling as it is in Drosophila. And so, because the nematodes are so easy to work with, there's a lot of work on understanding the aging process and still is using Cyanogans as a model system. C. elegans have um, very um, different kind of uh, behaviours, ranging from the simple to quite complex. So they um, are temperature sensitive, as I said, uh, really big at room temperature. The um, life cycle takes roughly about 25 days. If you change the temperature, then you can um, change how long that life cycle takes. So for example, if you grow them down at like 18 degrees, that life cycle goes up to about three and a half days. Likewise, if you increase the temperature, they undergo um, a stress response, a heat, stroke, heat shock response, as well as a cold shock response. They um, have a touch sensory behaviour. So if you have your nematode crawling across a plate and you're sat there with a microscope and you get one of those uh, yellow tip and you poke it on its head, it will shoot backwards. Likewise, if you go the other way and you touch it on its tail, it will shoot forward. So it um, has this touch response. They also um, like different tastes. We've already said about the E. coli. So, for example, it has this preference for the OP50 um, um, E. coli. And they're also able to smell um, different um, compounds, and that's what it's sought to allow it to you know, check out its environment. But it also has these complex behaviours. And so you can teach the elegance things. So it, it can learn and it also mem um, remembers things. So, for example, here, this is in the training stages. You've got your nematodes on your agar plate. And here, what you're doing is you're putting a chemical which has like a potent smell, but 
but you're adding it with food, okay? And if you keep doing that and you train it, what the nematode associates with is that smell correlates with me getting food, and so what it does is it then moves towards it. So then once they're trained, if you then just add that chemical to the smell but no E. coli, they will still aggregate to that space because they're expecting there to be food there, okay? So you can train them and, um, to, to learn things. And that comes quite interesting if you want to get into studying memory and behavioural responses such as that. You can actually use nematodes. You can train them. And obviously training nematodes to respond to something like that is a lot easier than having all these mice running around these mazes and then trying to study behavioural responses that way. So again, another use for C. elegans in the lab. What has made C. elegans an excellent model for studying and working with in the lab is the fact that it has this um, non-determinant um, genetic um, plasticity. So each nematode is made up of 959 cells. Okay? So there's your nematode, there's your 959 cells wandering across um, the screen. 302 of those are neurons. Males do have slightly more cells than the hermaphrodites. So that was a hermaphrodite walking across there. You could tell because it had the, the, the eggs in it. Males do have more cells, and that's because they have that they have a lot more of a fan-shaped tail. And in that fan-shaped tail, they have a lot more nerves because obviously they have to go and seek out the females, so they or the hermaphrodites. So they have to they have a lot more sensory um, re, um, ner nerves in them than the hermaphrodite does. And so when we talk about the nematodes, when we say they have this determinate development, what do we actually mean by that? And what we mean is that you can follow the division stages of the nematode for all of its different larval stages, all of its, um, so we call the embryogenesis, and that allows you to actually map them. So each cell will always go to the same place, okay? And it will all, that one cell will always go on to become something else. And so what that allowed is that allowed people to physically map out exactly where every cell goes during embryogenesis and what it becomes. And so this is basically every cell ever generated in um, the um, hermaphrodite, um, and it has been mapped and traced. And these days we can do this really easily. So if you watch this video, this is live cell imaging again. And you can watch, this is the embryo, you can watch it undergo cell division, and then you can mark the, the, the nuclei of the cells, you can count the cells and work out where exactly they go, how they separate in that um, during embryogenesis, where they're located, and what they eventually go on to, to become. And so if you were to do that, you get um, take some lemon, some of the, the egg when you watch it, you can then start to plot this out, for example. So you start off with it at your one cell stage, divide it into two, you can mark these, and then you can say, well, this one then goes on to split to make these, and then you can map them all out and colour code them. And you can see that you could quite easily do that, I don't know, in a few minutes right there and then. It wouldn't take you very long to do it. However, when it was done by this guy, John Solston, he didn't have live cell imaging. Okay, so... We weren't at that stage of science where you could basically take an embryo, put it under the microscope, tell the microscope to take images every five minutes, and you wander off and go and have your lunch, have a chat in the coffee room, or go home, and the microscope will just take all the images for you, and you just come back and hit play, you can just sit and watch it as a movie. When he did this, he, all he had was a basic microscope, which meant that what he had to do was to physically sit and watch cell division occurring um, in real time. And what he used to do is he'd go and lock himself in a dark room for, you know, between four and eight hours, depending as to how he was feeling on the day and how long his um, brain would allow him to sit in that isolation. And he would just stare down the microscope at the embryos and then draw them out. And these are um, the drawings from his notebook. Um, and, of course, doing that, it takes a lot longer than with our live cell imaging these days. So what you can do these days in the lab compared to what he did back then um, is quite phenomenal. But all of these things put together, and these guys here, and Sydney, Bob and John, it earned them a Nobel Prize. So it was definitely well worth the effort of sat there, sitting there, um, looking at all the cell division. So basically, the first Nobel Prize for the elegans was awarded in 2002, and that was for looking at cell division and looking at embryogenesis and looking at how 
um, the, the cells um, differentiated. Now, what can we do with, now we know that they're a great model system, what can we do with them? Well, a lot of us are interested in looking at differences in our, um, in our favoured genes or something like that. And what's good about C. elegans is that you can actually mutate them. So you have to remember that, unlike your bacteria, you are now working with a multicellular organism, okay? But just taking your gene and knocking it out is quite hard because you have to knock it out in every cell, okay? It's not just like you've got one bacteria, you knock it out, and then just every um, cell from that will then have its knockout. So one of the good things about C. elegans is that it can undergo um, mutagenesis via um, EMS. That's shown here. So has anyone come across this before? No? Nope. A few no's? Okay, so this is basically a very toxic chemical. Um, but what it does is it induces um, mutations into um, the genome. And the way in which it does this is it adds a ethyl group onto the, guan the guanine residue. And this addition of this ethyl group basically causes, so you know that um, G normally pairs with C, yeah, in the genetic code. So... A and T, G and C always pair together. But what this actually then does is it makes the G pair with T. So it's introducing a, a point mutation into your genome. And then, of course, that will go on and it will spread through, throughout um, the nematode's genome. And those one or two point mutations will either cause a frame shift, a stop mutation, or maybe that it will, won't um, have any effect if it doesn't change the, the genetic code. What do you think the limitations of using this are? It's random. It's random, yep, exactly. So it's random. So what's the, the, the limitation of using random mutagenesis? So you can't produce deliberate mutations, and you also might not know how many mutations you've got. Exactly. So what you've got to think about is when you do this, is you're taking your worm, you're exposing it to a chemical, and... The chances are you're not just going to introduce one mutation. You're going to introduce several mutations into the genome. And so that will result in you getting a phenotype. You've then got to work out, well, what gene have you mutated and how many genes have you mutated? And is your phenotype the result of one mutation or is it a combination of all those mutations that come together to make your, 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 your phenotype that you're observing? So, yes, it, but it does allow you. When, when might you want that? When might random mutagenesis be useful? If you just wanted to look at a particular phenotype, say um, life, uh, life expectancy, you do this to several different worms, look at ones that live much longer than the others, and then you look at the genes that cause that. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the thing behind that is what scientists call the fishing approach, right? You have no idea what gene is causing your, your, your phenotype. You know what your phenotype is you're looking for, but you have no idea what's causing it. So therefore, you don't have a target gene in mind. And so what you can then do is you can randomly mutate the genome and then look for mutants that have the phenotype that you want, and then you go back and you sequence it, okay? So random mutagenesis does allow you to do things when you don't have a target gene. And so... You, take, you do your mutagenesis, and then you um, take your, your nematodes and you look at them. This is your wild type. This is what a normal nematode looks like. Anyone want to tell me, describe the mutant in B. And it's a bit like catchphrase with the elegans, I'm afraid. So It's short and fat. It's short and fat, it is. So that is dumpy. Okay, short and fat is dumpy. Anyone want to go for C? Small. Yep, see, so you've done this before. And the last one. Long. Exactly. So, C. elegans, sort of naming the, 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 uh, the different food habits you get is a bit like cat trays. You just say what you see, and it's probably what, what you would expect. So, these ones that I'm showing you here are just the nice ones, because I never know how squeamish people are in the audience, and I don't want anyone passing out. Um, but you can get lots of different mutations where, so you can get something called like a bag of worms phenotype. And so basically what that is, is that's a defect in, in the ability of the hermaphrodite to lay eggs. So what happens is the eggs actually hatch inside the hermaphrodite, then eat their way out. Okay, so you can have that one. 
That's just why I can see people looking at it going, oh, that's why I didn't show you any, any videos of that. You can have things which are embryonic lethal, so basically the embryos um, don't develop. So when you look at your plates, all you basically see there is just a load of eggs and they never go on to develop into um, an embryo. And there are lots of different kind of erupting vulvas, there are lots of different horrible phenotypes that you can see, and I won't show you those ones today. Um, but yeah, basically, it's a, lo um, you, it's a bit like catchphrase. Just say what you see, and, and that will, you'll probably be in line with somebody else in the literature on what your mutant is. Okay, but there's another way that we can work with C. elegans and look at our, um, our different phenotypes, and that is by silencing genes using RNA-mediated interference. So, anyone else? What does, has everyone here heard of RNAi to start with? Is there anyone here who's never come across RNAi? Okay, brilliant. Is there anyone who is willing to give a definition, now that I know that you all know what it is, who's willing to give a definition? Um, uh, it's RNA that's complementary to the mRNA of the genes, so uh, the mRNA becomes degraded, so there's, so you get a reduction in protein counts. Exactly. So, what um, normally happens is you, um, you can express um, messenger R or RNA, double-stranded RNA, in an, uh, either in the nematode or in the environment of the nematode, and that then gets taken up. And what happens is that double-stranded RNA is incorporated into um, a complex um, known as RISC, and then it then gets chopped up by DICER into very small interfering nucleotides. These are about 20 to 23 nucleotides long. Okay. And so these short interfering RNAs are complementary to your gene of interest. So this really tells you that you've got a gene of interest, so this is tar a targeted approach. And those 23 nucleotides bind to your complementary RNA, and that binding then induces um, the degradation of that messenger RNA. So what then happens is if you have no messenger RNA, you have then obviously... Um, you decrease the amount of protein levels that you have inside your nematode, effectively silencing that gene. Um, one thing which is unique about C. elegans and why RNAi has been so successful in C. elegans is all due to the expression of one gene, which is called SID1. So SID1 is a transporter which basically allows the transport of those short RNA interfering, short interfering RNAs throughout the whole of the nematode. Okay? So we can do get um, RNA into nematodes by very different methods. So the most easy and cost-effective way is just to feed them bacteria which express double-stranded RNA. So what you would do there is you would take your gene of a region of your gene of interest, put it into a plasmid which basically has two opposing promoters, and so the one that we used to use was called T7, and so basically that would then go both ways around your plasmid and you would then get double-stranded RNA and all you would simply do is you'd make the bacteria express that by, because you're using a T7 um, promoter, you can just express using IPTG. Get your double-stranded RNA inside your bacteria. You feed the bacteria to the worms. They eat, uh, eat the, the worms eat the bacteria. And then in the gut, what would happen is that that um, RNA would then be transmitted from the intestine through the whole of the organism using that SID1 transporter. Okay. Um, likewise, you can soak them in RNA, and so basically, again, we've already said that they've got this basically cavity which is open, the mouth, and so they would just literally just, again, just swallow it straight away. Or if you've got a particularly nasty gene, you can try micro-inject them. So um, if your gene is very hard to target, you might actually want to physically micro-inject the RNA in. But basically, what happens here is that that RNA is then transported around the whole of the nematode by SID1. So nematodes that don't have SID1, and there are families within Signora habitatis that do not express SID1, you cannot use RNAi, because basically all that happens is it will go into the gut, get digested, and then excreted out, and so you'll never actually get the effects of RNAi. So that's why C. elegans has become um, a nice model. And so what you can see here, here's a very basic example of RNAi happening. So what you've got here is you've got a protein which has been tagged with um, green fluorescent protein, a GFP. And so here you're feeding the nematodes um, this HT115 bacteria. So this is basically a bacteria that allows the production of double-stranded RNA, okay? 
And so um, this is em you're feeding them with empty vectors. So basically, they're not really producing any of the um, RNA. So this is your mock control, and you can see that you've got your GFP protein. However, you take these nematodes and you feed them. So here you've got your plasmid, which has you put the GFP into it. So now what you've got is that plasmid is producing double-stranded RNA to the GFP. You feed that to the nematodes, and you can see that you basically lose that GFP fluorescence. So that's RNAi working in principle. Again, this is a targeted approach, so you need to know the sequence of your gene. Luckily, the Thiergans, the whole genome has been mapped. And now, actually, there are libraries. You can actually buy an RNAi library, which has every gene of C. elegans in this um, vector system to allow you to actually um, knock down the whole of your genes. So you can do a very big screening approach where if you still don't have any idea as to what gene you want to knock down, you could basically do RNAi across the whole of the genome and work out um, what gene is responsible for your particular phenotype. Um, and that's due to the, the, uh, the work of the community that have come together to create this bank um, of mutants. Does anyone know what the limitations of RNAi are? You might not get complete knockdown. You don't know exactly how much RNAi is going to be. Exactly. So one of the things is that you never know what you're going to get. So when you knock it down... Um, sometimes you can knock down 90% of the messenger RNA, so you can guarantee that you only get a very strong phenotype. Other genes, you can only ever get like 20-30% um, to 30 knocked down. And nobody quite understands why that is, whether that's due to um, something, uh, secondary structures or things like that in, 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 the, in the gene, which, permit, which prevent the, the RNA I from having an effect. Um, it's still really known that there are genes which are really, really hard to target um, by this, this method um, to get complete knockdown. And you still do get slight off-target effects. Yeah, sorry. There's also, if you've got genes that are similar in um, sequence, then it'll knock down several different genes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So if you've got a family of genes, and so you're only working with 23 nucleotides, remember, that's what your, no matter how big a chunk of RNA you put in, it all goes down to 23 nucleotides. So if you've got some genes which have a very um, homologous regions in those 23 nucleotides, then you will get off-target effects. So you might be looking at uh, different, lots of pro uh, proteins which are having um, your effect there. So that is, again, another limitation that you have to think about whilst working um, with the, the nematodes. And so in 2006, um, Timothy and Fire were awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of RNAi. Um, which then allow people to um, really get in and, and use the, the, um, the nematode to study lots of these functions. As I say, that led to the generation of all these different libraries and different plasmids and constructs that you can actually just buy and just use it in your laboratory. So one of the key things um, which helps it also is that the nematode is transparent. And so... That allows you to actually see individual cells and you can watch um, things happening in real time. And so here, basically, what we're doing there, that is somebody doing a micro-injection. So they are injecting double-stranded RNA into the, the, the gonad of the, the organism to hopefully allow that to um, um, spread throughout the uh, entire population. But you can also use it um, to study... Um, the localization of things. So what we've got here is we've got some proteins that we've tagged with um, M. cherry and GFP. And then what you can see, because the nematode is transparent, you can then actually look at the location um, of the of the different proteins and where they are. And so that's obviously very key if you know that your gene of interest, you want to know where it's located in the, in the organism, um, you can then actually tag that with, with a fluorescent protein um, and visualize exactly where it is. And then you can see whether what happens over time, how does that develop, how, and how is it regulated at the protein level. So we've talked about you know, messenger RNA knocking that down. If you want to look at protein stability, for example, you can't do that with, with RNA, RNAi. So basically you can then tag your protein and look for how long does it take for your protein to degrade. So that's another thing you have to think about with RNAi, is that you know, if you grow your nematodes up, they're going to have that protein present until you've introduced your, um, your RNAi. And basically, if you've got a very stable protein and it has a very, very low um, 
turnover rate, then it's going to take a lot longer for your RNAi to have an effect because the protein is already there. And so you need to wait for it to be um, degraded before you then are reliant on the synthesis of more protein. And so you can look at protein stability by tagging your proteins with GFP. And so that brought C. elegans on to share its third Nobel Prize in 2008 for the work on using um, GFP. So maybe small in um, size, but C. elegans has already um, been attributed to three Nobel Prizes, um, which is remarkable um, work from, from the community. So one other key thing about C. elegans then is it's, a, is it's um, invariant nervous system as well. Okay, so we've already said that it has 959 somatic cells, but also what it has is it has this nervous system um, which has been fully mapped. So this is the first ever published connectome um, in any multi-species, multi and it's still probably the best understanding we have of uh, the development of the nervous system. So you can see here, and here's, again, here's your head, so this is the nerve ring here, and you can see you've got all the different synapses running through uh, the nematode's body. And so what John White did is he wanted to actually explore exactly how all of these nerves are connected, and so the way in which he did this is he took a nematode and he cut that nematode into 8,000 um, serial sections and basically looked at it under the electron microscope. And then he sat there, just the same as um, the other John did, and he just sat there and then mapped out the whole of the connectome from, from the nematode. So working out exactly, you probably can't see it on here, but you can see here he's numbered all the different uh, nerves in here and he's followed them right way through to actually map out the whole of the connectome um, of, the, of the nematode. And so if you're anything like me and you like watching... Um, Biology um, in action. If you look at here, so this is the map. This bit here is a grinder. So this is how C. elegans eats. So it has basically two pumps here. So the food comes in here, and then basically this thing, this grinder, it she just does it. It just grinds all the food up, so all of the E. coli up, and then it passes into the intestine. And this is regulated via calcium signaling. So if we look at this, so here's your grinder here, and so you, we're using a, a, a calcium dye. And basically you can watch the oscillations and where you have red is when you have the highest concentration of the calcium and the lowest concentration outside. And you can see how the calcium fluxes change during the pumping um, of, that, um, of the grinder. So that's actually allowing you to watch and un study um, biology in action. Of course, if you've then got your mutants that you're interested in, you can then look at how the calcium um, oscillations change in your different mutants and what consequence that has on the ability of the organism to eat food and survive. They've been used a lot in um, space um, research. So, as I've already said, they have um, they have muscles, and so they've been used in sort of space shuttle things to understand the effects of zero gravity on muscles. Um, and these these samples came from just down the road in Nottingham. Um, unfortunately, they were the only thing ever to survive anything to survive the Columbia space disaster in two thousand and three. So. Fairly hardy creatures um, with um, a variety of, of applications um, to be used. And they are still used a lot in space research at the moment. Okay, so key take-home uh, messages from today's uh, lecture then is that nematodes are a great... Um, C. elegans is a great model nematode for studying in the lab. And that's because it has a rapid growth rate. If you want to study something like, you know, Parkinson's, you don't want to have to wait until... you your organism gets to be, you know, 10, 5, 10 years old. If you can speed that up by having a, a, a nematode with a, a, a quicker life cycle, it allows you to study these processes a lot better. What aids in that study is the, the, the transparency of the organism, allowing you to actually look at the, the organism and to see what's going on, to tag your favourite proteins with GFP and look at where they're localised. Most things these days now have a sequence genome, so it's kind of losing its novelty with a complete sequence genome. Um, but that is, of course, a, a, um, a very uh, important contribution. If you speak to some of my guys in my lab who work on these 
filamentous fungi, which we do not have the full genome sequence for, they can tell you how frustrating it is when I tell them to go and find this gene, and they're like, they can't because I haven't got a genome sequence. So it is still a benefit. And there are still a few organisms out there where we don't have the genome sequence. Um, easily, to, easily to be stored and maintained, frozen down, um, very, very easy to, to work with, um, and there's basically no ethics involved in that, okay? No one's going to come along and, you know, find out how many nematodes you killed last week in your assays, okay? Um, and, and they do have all the things like the rudimentary organs, so guts and, and, and things like that, so that you can study um, some of your favourite infections um, in a lot more um, detail. So with that, I will finish um, and just remind you that there are lots of modern organisms out there which you can use to um, address your particular um, research question. Just make sure that you are using the right model for yourself. So C. elegans may work for you, it may not. You want to do immunity stuff and they don't have things like, you know, the macrophages, the phagocytes, the T cells and all that thing. So if you want to study T cell biology, Nematode is probably not going to help you out there. You're going to have to go to something else, okay? So make sure that you use the right model organism for your question. Okay, and with that, I will leave you. I believe you are back in here anyway in the next 10 minutes for, um, with um, Dr. Soller for your next lecture. Um, but if anyone has any questions, um, please do get in contact with me. I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>